Well, this, this morning, if my, uh, if my voice cracks and I sound like I'm going through puberty, it's possible that um, it may crack like that today. Yesterday, there was, um, at the University of Arkansas, they host each fall a, uh, it's really just a cross-country meet, but there are events that begin early in the morning and go throughout the whole day. Uh, and in Zachary's event alone, there were 850 high school boys If you can imagine about 100 yards away having 850 high school boys and them all start at the same time and all running towards you and they all go past, I mean, it just is intimidating. And uh, the cloud of dust that it stirs up as they go, I still feel like I have grit in my teeth today, but uh, it's kind of made my allergies flare up a little bit today. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 6, it's good to see you this morning. Acts chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 10, and we're also going to take a look over in chapter 7. I have the two references here for you on the screen. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. This is the account concerning Stephen. And it says, And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. And they put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place And alter the customs which Moses had done down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now beginning in chapter 7, Stephen begins his defense. Uh, He begins to explain his actions. He recounts the history of the Israelites. And how that throughout their history they had been stiff-necked how they had been rebellious throughout their history. And if you look in chapter 7, beginning in verse 51, we find the conclusion of his words. Verse 51, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, and ears always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Did you know that there are countries still today in the world that practice stoning as capital punishment? I found it by accident. I was really looking up what it was like to be stoned and to consider a stoning and the pain that would be involved in it or how it would go about and actually found pictures, modern day pictures of people being stoned. I can only imagine... And I picked up one from our parking lot. I had one up here earlier, but I've changed it out for this one. Now, I think we all could agree that if you dropped a rock like this on your foot, it would hurt. 
I can't imagine having this thrown at me. Can you? Can you imagine how much that would hurt to have that thrown at you one time? This thing's pretty heavy. Or any rock of any size would hurt. And so as, as I consider this story, this event we've just looked at concerning Stephen, I'm really intrigued and I'm really amazed because it's easy for us when we read Bible events to emotionally detach ourselves from them because we know them so well. And so we sit back in our comfortable distance and say, wow, that was impressive that Stephen would die so admirably. And sometimes we lose just exactly what happened with regards to Stephen and the reality of it. Consider that like crucifixion, death by stoning was painful and agonizing. Depending upon how long it took, it could take quite a while and be very painful for a prolonged period of time. So it is not remarkable to me that during this time, this moment of agony that Stephen prayed, it is remarkable to me that in this moment of agony, agony that Stephen prayed for forgiveness. I, I'm just, I just can hardly understand it. If I put myself in the position of having that rock thrown at me and com being thrown at me continually and the wounds and the, the, the different places on my body, maybe breaking bones, hitting me in the head. I'm just telling you from my own human experience, I don't know that these would have been the words that would have come from my mouth. We might expect him to pray this. Father, avenge me. Father, deliver me, rescue me from this moment. Or we might expect him to say, Father, punish them for what they've done to me. As he's there in agony and he's hurting and they're throwing rocks at him. Or for him to even say, why me, Lord? Why aren't you protecting me? I've been faithful to you. Why me? This morning we're going to consider the discipline of forgiveness. And I'll just begin by telling you this is a tough one. Because forgiveness can be very difficult for us. It's why I've classified it in this, these lessons as a discipline. Because like anything that is kind of unnatural to us, we have to work a little extra hard to exercise it in our lives. And forgiveness is one of those things that really doesn't come natural to us. Holding a grudge, continuing to throw it in someone's face, that's more like what we are as humans to be forgiving is more godlike and something we have to work on in our lives because our nature is to hold things against a person and to not forgive. And so this morning we're going to look at this topic with these points. And I've tried to make them words that a forgiving person would say. So first is what the one who's done the offense would say, I'm sorry. And the others are, are words of the forgiven person or the one who's wanting or trying to forgive, I guess. I forgive you. I'm letting God handle this. I will forgive emotionally and I will forgive myself. First, I'm sorry. You know it's hard to apologize. Usually when I apologize, I want to qualify it. I want to minimize it. I want to justify it. I want to add something to it. I want to say, I'm sorry, but you made me mad. Or, I'm sorry, but that's the way I am. Um, 
we want to add something to it to kind of make it where it's not really an apology. It's kind of an apology, but it kind of takes away the idea that I'm sorry. So I would like to encourage you, when it comes to apologizing, that you make it simply heartfelt and simple. I'm sorry. No excuses, no reasons, no minimizing, no qualifying, no justifying, just heartfelt and genuine. Because we all need to apologize, don't we? We all have things we need to apologize for. And sometimes the best answer is just to say, I did it, I blew it, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. And move on. Because forgiveness is a part of every relationship. It's a part of our relationships with one another in the church. It's a part of our relationships with our spouse. It's a part of our relationship with God. I'm sorry. Admitting our failings to another and asking for forgiveness is difficult. It's one of the most humbling experiences that there is. It's one of them. It's very difficult. To go to a person and to admit that you've done something wrong and to apologize for it is a very humbling thing. So what are the reasons why that I stop saying I'm sorry? Well, here are some reasons I stop saying I'm sorry. My pride. It's just too humiliating to say that I'm sorry. So I won't do it or don't do it or do it less than I should because my pride simply won't let me do it. Or what about this one? Maybe because I think I'm unforgivable. You know, I've asked too many times. And so, you know, I had this, I asked a teacher this question one time when I was in high school, a Bible class teacher. He gave me an answer which was very relieving to me as a young man. He said, you know, if I have asked God for forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over again, at what point will God say, you've asked too many times? And he said, never. But I think that sometimes we will bring ourselves to a position of having asked for forgiveness so often that we consider ourselves unforgivable. And so I just stop saying I'm sorry because I don't feel deserving of forgiveness anymore. Or here's another one kind of from the opposite extreme. Why I stop saying I'm sorry is because I think it's everyone else's fault it's, it's n I never bring any kind of reproach upon myself or consider anything for myself, which goes along with this last one, that I apply chastisement from God to everyone else. So I might sit in, in a lesson that's a Bible class, and the teacher's talking about a certain point, and in my heart I'm saying, I sure hope that person heard that. Oh, that person's not here today, and they needed to hear that. And never get around to thinking that this is something that I need to consider that God's bringing as a chastisement or a rebuke upon me as a person. I need to be the one to think about this and not just apply it to everyone else. And I consider you even in this lesson to not do that. Boy, I sure hope he heard that today. He needs to forgive somebody. Instead of considering what do I need to do. Or next in our list here, because I, I don't care anymore. Um, someone told me one time that the opposite of love in a marriage relationship is not hate, it is indifference. It's, I don't care anymore. And so I have to work at my heart to keep it soft, to keep to where I do care. Or maybe it's because I've stopped repenting. I've just become hard-hearted about it, and I don't, I don't, I don't repent anymore. So I don't say that I'm sorry because I'm not wanting or willing to make a change in my life. So in this first point, before we actually get into the forgiveness side of the lesson, I wanted to begin with the apology side because it is important for us to own our sins and to say I'm sorry. No strings. 
no, I'm sorry, but, or I'm sorry if, it's just, I'm sorry, because I did it. The prodigal son said, I will get up, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. It's an amazing statement of repentance. It's simple. It takes full ownership of the sin. It doesn't blame anybody else. It's heartfelt. Number two, I forgive you. Turn to Matthew chapter 18 now. This is a great guide scripture with regards to forgiveness. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, Peter comes forth and asks Jesus about forgiveness. And Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven will be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have the means to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all he had until the repayment was made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he said to him, seize him. He began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. And so his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. And so when his fellow slave saw what happened... They were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And so shall my heavenly Father also do to you to each of you who does not forgive his brother from his heart. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus taught, For if you forgive others for their trespass or transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now listen carefully. It's not because the other person deserved it. It was because he had received it. The fact that I have received forgiveness obligates me to be forgiving to other people. And so I forgive. It's a personal obligation. It's a moral obligation for me to be a forgiving person. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We must cultivate hearts then that are ready to forgive. And when someone says, I'm sorry, I say, I forgive you. Number three, I'm going to let God handle things. I'm going to let God handle handle things. Now, I usually don't do quotes from movies, but Gwendolyn Tennyson encouraged me to go see War Room, and I did this past week, and there's one quote I'm going to bring from that movie that I thought is fitting for this point. 
Miss Clara told Elizabeth, you're fighting the wrong enemy. It's not your job to fix your husband. You need to plead with God so he can do what only he can do and then get out of the way. I like it because it is really a statement of I'm going to let God handle things. I'm going to let him to deal with all the inequities in this. In this situation where someone's asked for my forgiveness and I've told them that I forgive them, I'm going to have to allow God to work in this situation to make it better. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The reason I'm going to let God handle this is because I don't want to be a negative, bitter, wounded person in the world. I'm going to let God handle these things, and I'm going to move forward with my life. I have to. It's hard to do. We must exercise ourselves in this. It's a discipline. But if you've wronged someone, you have and I have an obligation to say, I'm sorry. And if someone has said to you or to me, I'm sorry, I have an obligation to say, I forgive you, and I'm going to let God handle the rest of it. That's what relationships are all about and being Christian family is all about. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. God can handle it. Number four, I will forgive emotionally. We're digging a deeper hole here, aren't we? Because it's, it's a lot easier for me to forgive someone with my words. It's a lot more difficult for me to forgive someone with my heart. And so I can tell someone, I forgive you, but the wounds are often there for a long, long time. So the emotional scars of wrongs against us are harder to remove. Often, they're the consequences of another sin remaining in my life. So the sin remains, it's still there, it still hurts, there are consequences. And part of the consequences of our sin and of wounding other people is the emotional scar that continues to linger. Just work on it. Work on it. I would like to suggest to you that time helps. Time makes it better. Doing the right things help. You know, I'm still emotionally wounded by this, but I'm going to continue to do the right things. I'm going to treat the person with love. I'm going to do what's right by them. I'm going to be kind to them, even though I've been wounded by them. They've asked for forgiveness. I've forgiven them. God's going to handle things, and now I'm going to move forward. My heart is still going to be hurting. It's still going to be wounded, but I'm going to do the right things. I'm going to show actions of love, and I'm going to do what I can to work through it. And God helps us. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. What is this verse, these verses, this verse describing? Love. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. So this is the emotional part of this. It doesn't keep records in our hearts of the wrongs committed against us. Instead, we move forward. We forgive. Number five, and finally, I forgive myself. I would like to suggest to you that the inability to forgive ourselves can really siphon out the life of our spirits. We're down on ourselves, feel unforgivable, unlovable but thinking that I am unforgivable limits the power of the cross because God says he can forgive us through Christ and thinking that I'm unforgivable limits the mercy of another 
We are called to show mercy upon one another and to forgive one another. God forgives. In Isaiah 1, 18, Come now and let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So forgive yourself and move on and let God handle things. It is not remarkable to me then that in the moment of agony that Stephen prayed, but it is remarkable to me that he prayed this prayer of forgiveness. Because when I think about a rock like this and be, being thrown at me, my heart will probably, most likely, be filled with revenge and anger and disappointment, maybe even that God would allow this to happen to me. But Stephen teaches us in this lesson today the power and the importance of forgiveness. It's a discipline that we must work on in our lives. If someone in this room today has injured you, accept their apology. If you've injured someone in this room, tell them that you're sorry. Genuine, heartfelt. We are obliged to forgive others. Not because of the deservingness of the person who's asking for forgiveness, but because of how much we've been forgiven ourselves. And because we want to continue to be forgiven by God ourselves. So we should cultivate hearts that are ready to forgive. Let's bow for a prayer. Father, I thank you for your great forgiveness of us. And we pause now to ask you to please forgive us, to tell you that we're sorry for our sins. When it comes to forgiving each other, Lord, it's difficult. It's difficult to admit that we're wrong. It's difficult to admit it to others and to ask for their forgiveness. It's difficult for us to forgive others with our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us. That you'll help me. You'll help each one of us to be forgiving people and to exercise this discipline in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there someone you need to forgive today? Stand and encourage one another with this song. If you'd like to respond, please come.